Good afternoon. Welcome to the SAGES AHPBA panel in minimally invasive surgery. I am Horacio Aspen, uh, one of the coordinators. In uh, our first presentation then, and for the back, is going to be um, uh, Craig Fisher, uh, complications of laparoscopic pancreas surgery, current data. Horacio, thank you very much for the invitation. I appreciate it very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, members of uh, SAGES, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about a, an interesting subject. Uh, if you look at the uh, current data about complications related to laparoscopic Whipple, being asked to cover the open uh, complication section too, it's actually quite easy to do uh, given uh, a lot of the comparative studies that have been done and I think uh, those studies actually represent a contemporary uh, uh, data set for complications in open surgery. Uh, just some brief comments uh, initially before I begin. The first is that in Whipple operation uh, for cancer or benign indications, uh, the uh, ball has moved off of the area of perioperative complications a long time ago. And uh, reports are much more a part of a more global assessment of uh, patient health and well-being as it regards to a particular type of treatment. So uh, for cancer, uh, that would be uh, es essentially impact on um, uh, margin, but of course survival um, and uh, how it impacts upon uh, uh, chemotherapy and benign disease. Uh, chronic pancreatitis, uh, uh, Whipple operations and Fry and other uh, procedures have focused much more on uh, pain relief and long-term quality of life and um, you, you see a lot less of the reports about you know, leak rates and uh, length of stay and that sort of thing. It's not to say the battle is over there, uh, it's just to say that that is the area initially that Horacio and I and others focused our, our work when we reported a uh, larger series of laparoscopic uh, Whipple patients. We focused on the perioperative outcomes attempting to compare it to uh, previous. But well, one thing I'm gonna tell you today is I think it's incumbent upon us not to just simply show that we can do it, uh, but that, that you know, we can uh, do it with some outcomes that are uh, not just reasonable, but that there is an improvement related to um, uh, outcomes for patients. So to advance this, which do I push? This one? This guy, okay. There we go. So, I guess I call this, look, Ma, no hands when you're riding your, um, your bicycle. Uh, we can do it, but why do it? Let me ask yourselves that. Other than competition and the fact that we're all accomplished professionals and we want to push our own envelope, why do it? If it's more expensive, for sure. It takes up a lot of operating time. If you look at my last uh, comment there, capitated healthcare systems, uh, they limit their use of laparoscopic <laughs> and robotic uh, procedures, rightfully so, because of the increased utilization of operating room time, uh, the unjustified capital uh, costs that are associated with a lot of these operations relative to the uh, lack of proof of benefits for patients. So uh, we have to demonstrate uh, significant benefits uh, uh, and, and particularly show that there's a good reason to do this and to justify the increased uh, costs that are associated with this. Analysis beyond perioperative uh, outcomes is required. We've got to look at specific variables that have uh, uh, impact on cancer outcomes, recurrence, time to return to work, and the other sort of variables that, that I was just talking about, and move the ball off of simply report of reporting of uh, perioperative outcomes. I think you'll hear a similar theme in the liver um, uh, area by Dave as well, and that is that I think it's well established that in series that are some of which are quite well controlled or, or hand-picked and others are uncontrolled, outcomes are really quite similar amongst patients who have open and laparoscopic HPV surgery. Um, certainly, inferior outcomes have never been uh, uh, demonstrated in any, any large numbers. Um, so that's what I want us to focus on is um, why are we doing this and what, what specific benefits there are. Um, Horacio wrote in a paper uh, some time ago that it's really our uh, requirement here to, uh, um, to demonstrate uh, benefits for patients uh, that are uh, it, you know, it, in excess of that that they receive for uh, the open operation. And uh, given that Dr. Mavi's arrived, uh, I will, I'll go ahead and limit my comments to laparoscopy and then we can do the comparison to, uh, to the open era. So um, the year after Dr. Mavi was president of SSAT, I reported uh, on laparoscopic Whipple for cancer uh, and 90-day outcomes. We looked at margin status, um, adequacy of resection, and some of the variables that I was just telling you about. 
Uh, we presented that at SSAT, and we looked at a series of 53 patients who underwent laparoscopic Whipple uh, for cancer, and we compared them to matched patients uh, who'd undergone open surgery uh, using a, uh, uh, a propensity um, scoring analysis. This is actually a virtual randomized trial, if you will. The uh, difficulties of randomized trials are obvious to most, most of them. We have a very large database of contemporary open patients. The computer essentially looks for uh, groups of patients that look uh, similar to the, the laparoscopic ones, and we do a, a comparison. So if you look at the demographic characteristics of our patients who underwent lap versus open, 53 and 53, uh, you know, there's no significant difference in their uh, preoperative comorbidities, their pathology. Uh, you know, 90% of these patients had ductal adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. Uh, there were, you know, the, the uh, few and infrequence were equal in, on, on both sides. So very similar. If we look at the perioperative outcomes, and this theme will come uh, to you in a moment, uh, the uh, operative time was longer. Um, the blood transfusion rate was uh, significantly less, actually, um, and that was not a surprise to us. Um, Horacio's paper, uh, which I'll show you in a minute, has a much greater decrease in blood loss. And just before I go through all the data, why? Why would that be? It's obvious to all of us, but not obvious to everybody. And that is the pneumoperitoneum and the pressure exceeds that of CVP and, ex and decreases venous oozing uh, in an open abdomen that uh, is you know, also becoming dehydrated, essentially in a cold operating room. There's a big difference, uh, particularly when there's a large open dissection um, area. So I'm not, I'm not surprised. The fistula rate, uh, oh, blood transfusion was different as well within the first 24 hours. Um, and the fistula rates of Bs and Cs, those are the significant fistulas, uh, as well as delayed gastric emptying, uh, length of stay, were all uh, not different. Now, length of stay, it not sig statistically significantly different. And when I started to do this, uh, Dr. Mavi and others said to me, he said, the driver of this in terms of patients uh, 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 in hospital stay, it's the ileus and it's the pancreatic anastomosis. So how would that be better? Ileus would not resolve, we wouldn't think much faster with a Whipple. It's an awful lot of bowel manipulation that occurs. And that's exactly what we found. Other papers have actually shown an advantage, but part of my point of my um, uh, focus on our data is that the, the money's not in the hospital, so to speak. Some of it is with in terms of margin, in terms of blood loss. If we look at the tumor size, uh, the, uh, the R status, regional lymph nodes that were uh, positive, those were uh, uh, all the same. And, you know, I, it was my interest at least to, I was hoping that we would show equivalency. This is my concern for doing an unselected series of cancer patients is that we would have, I mean, I didn't pick, I didn't cherry pick anybody. Uh, we just, we did 53 uh, uh, in a row that were, that were cancer. And I was happy to see that there were not differences in the tumor size and that the margin positivity and lymph node um, issues were the same. But here's what's interesting. Patients who receive adjuvant therapy at six weeks, this, you can understand this in laparoscopy, they're much more likely to receive adjuvant therapy at six weeks if they had laparoscopic surgery than if they had open. Patients have, it's amazing how they look about the same when they go home, but a week later, when you see patients uh, as an outpatient, they begin to recover faster, and it's those incisional uh, issues, seromas, uh, infections that uh, oftentimes um, uh, cause oncologists to not begin therapy at the target of six weeks um, after, after your resection. Uh, but secondly, the performance status of patients, with Karnofsky as our, our, our assay here, was significantly different. People got better faster. That makes sense to all of us uh, in the laparoscopic world. Uh, but this, was, this is what we're looking for. These have, th those, to me, are real uh, benefits for patients because it is an unsolved problem in open surgery where patients become debilitated and don't ever receive their chemotherapy if it's an adjuvant model. Uh, or they do so uh, quite late, or they, they start and don't finish. So I think this is an area where we potentially can impact things. Looking at Dr. Asman's uh, study, uh, he examined lap versus open Whipple uh, and looking at the accordion severity grading system. This is a, similar to the Clavian system uh, in that it grades uh, complications in a flexible way and in a more, in a more uh, 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 you know, large uh, uh, manner versus small granular manner. It's, it's, it's actually quite useful. And a couple things were interesting. If you looked at uh, the big difference they had here, open on the uh, left side, lap on the right, uh, they had 215 patients who underwent uh, laparoscopic, uh, open, and uh, 53 who uh, underwent uh, laparoscopic. There, there was a difference in the percentage of patients who underwent antrectomy. So pylorus preserving was much more uh, common in laparoscopic, and that was significant. And I think that, uh, uh, excuse me, Horacio, but I do think that that introduces a, a potential bias in terms of uh, delayed gastric emptying and, and, and those sorts of things. If you look at the pathology, they were very uh, similar uh, in terms of uh, adenocarcinoma and the percentage of uh, uh, 
uh, uh, you know, mildly malignant issues like uh, PNATs and then of course the uh, uh, benign or pre-malignant uh, lesions. If you look though at this table, this, uh, this table is what's interesting, I think, um, and I'm gonna blow it up, I think. It, you're looking at tumor size diameter and it was the same. A uh, number of lymph nodes, uh, uh, positive lymph nodes were the same, but the lymph node yield was greater in patients with laparoscopy. And any of us who've done this uh, will tell you that it's, I have seen lymph nodes I didn't even know existed before. To see the lymph nodes that, that we see doing a laparoscopic Whipple, you would have to stand underneath the table and look up at the porta. With a 30 degree scope, we're seeing all sorts of things and the ability to triangulate and work uh, uh, just the way that you do it, it, with esophageal surgery or hiatal surgery. The advantages are there uh, mechanically and visually uh, that you can't, uh, you can't uh, see or do otherwise. So I'm not surprised that the lymph node uh, harvest was, uh, uh, was greater. Um, and uh, th that's th the other issue here was the lymph node uh, ratio trended towards, um, uh, quote, positivity, but I don't think, it, I don't think trends really are valid. Personally. So I'm going to finish up here with uh, a recent uh, study that was reported by um, Chris Wolfgang and the Hopkins group. Uh, and for a group that has spent so much time uh, presenting massive numbers of, uh, of their own uh, uh, cases, this is actually uh, a meta-analysis. But I think it's, it's of the meta-analyses, which I generally don't like. Uh, this one is actually, I think, very good. Um, so a couple things here. Um, they began uh, with 800 uh, cases uh, in the literature with quite strict um, uh, inclusion criteria uh, for analysis. And I think that's uh, one of the real advantages of this particular meta-analysis. Uh, th so if you had a lap or a hand-assisted operation, uh, you were included, but you were excluded if you had a robotic resection and a nucleation or trauma. They had, the papers had to report the uh, fistulas uh, according to the International um, uh, Study Group on Pancreatic Fistulas Grading System. So that's a, a, a big jump forward to see the percentage of our authors that are using uniformed, widely accepted uh, 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 variables uh, to present their um, data. As you probably know, distal pancreatectomy has had uh, a million different definitions in, until the last five years of, of fistula. And so again, uh, they ended up with 18 uh, papers uh, uh, for analysis, and I think they were uh, quite, uh, quite correct. I don't know about you, but when I read a meta-analysis, this is what I do. I stand way back and look at the <laughs> look at the at the trends and which side the dots end up on. And uh, if, if you look at it here in detail, uh, it is wound infections in particular that are significantly less in patients who have a laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy versus an open, and that's for all indications. It was true in cancer, it was true in benign uh, disorders, it was true in pre-malignant disorders. The length of stay is significantly less. Uh, blood loss was not less uh, uniformly, it, it was uh, closer to the center. Uh, but uh, most of the outcomes that we just spoke about uh, previously uh, that are important in terms of margin when it was cancer um, and, uh, and uh, you know, perioperative outcomes, they were uh, not the same, they were better. So if you remember when I started this uh, talk, and Dr. Mavi and I again and others have been speaking about this uh, uh, for some time, it's we must demonstrate that laparoscopy for this particular uh, area of surgery is not the same but better because it's a lot more expensive. And so what we, we have to demonstrate that. And I think uh, that this is one study that shows that there's no question distal pancreatectomy for any indication it is a better operation in hands uh, that are educated and, 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 and trained to do it and uh, I, I'm, I'm personally not surprised. So I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, convincing data exist uh, to me that suggests that laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy is superior to open. That does not mean that open pa distal pancreatectomy should not be performed uh, and is not performed. There are plenty of operations, a ramps procedure, anterior, posterior, you know, a, 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 a vascular issues, many things would require you to potentially have to do it open. Many chronic pancreatitis operations, as you know, are quite difficult uh, when you do a distal. But uh, overall, there is convincing data to, to support that statement. In cancer, laparoscopic Whipple may be superior to open. It appears to be in blood loss, it appears to be that patients have a preserved uh, patient functional status and that the number of lymph nodes and some other factors, margin, et cetera, appear to be better. Not notice two or three years ago if I was giving this talk, I would have been talking about equivalent outcomes and we would have been happy uh, that we had equivalent outcomes in a highly selected group of patients. But uh, we are actually uh, more convincingly at least talking about superior outcomes uh, in, in, in certain areas. So. 
there's lots of work to be done. These are not, uh, I don't want to make uh, real broad sweeping um, generalizations. Uh, I think that future reports need to analyze key data points uh, that are uh, uh, real, uh, 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 you know, real world data points for patient outcomes and to, to get our get the rock off of perioperative outcomes and look at uh, the same contemporary data points that are being shown by our open colleagues uh, regarding the disease management in a much more uh, broad um, uh, level. And many studies have not done that, and that's a challenge of ours to do that. And new study designs, um, I think, are required to overcome many of the obstacles that, that uh, that exist to randomized trials. I think it's too often and too easy that the resident who's up here presenting says, well, the next st step of this blah, blah, blah is a randomized trial. Investigator-initiated work is difficult to do. Randomized trials in any area, particularly sur surgery, have a great deal of difficulty and a lot of bias involved. And I'll leave it at that to you read about it, but there are many scientific designs that are um, valid, widely used, and can allow meaningful comparisons uh, uh, to other groups without a randomized trial. And I think if we do that, we're actually likely to accrue more patients and have more patients for analysis. Horacio, Dr. Mavi, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Craig.